Thank you for coming. Now, you've written a great deal about, in some ways, not having a native country, not having a language of your own that's clearly yours, or even a culture. Having read or reread all of your work and surrounding works, and if I think, you know, how do I frame you? I would say I think of you as a Rhode Islander, because that's where you grew up. You were born in England, but came here when you were three, grew up in Rhode Island. How would you react to that? Uncomfortably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, with all due respect. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's true. It's, um, well, first of all, thank you all very much for coming and for your warm welcome. Um, uh, it, it is true that I lived there. Well, let's see how long did I live there from the age of three to 18. Right. So 15 years. And you went to Barnard at 18, right? I did. Yes. And so then I, um, I think I lived as for as long in New York as I did in Rhode Island. But of course, one's childhood is, is one's childhood and is formative. Um, and in a way that later experiences are not. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, it is a part of who I am, absolutely, but I, I, I don't feel, um, I mean, I've always had a very uneasy relationship with the place, and, and you know, you mentioned the, the essay in State by State, um, one of these books that have been kindly uh, assembled here, <laughs> such a lovely display really i'm so touched um but i was asked to to write about rhode island um in this anthology called state by state which um invited a number of authors to write about um their home state or a, a state with, with you know that they had some sort of connection to in any case um and so i i chose rhode island um uh, I mean, I was asked to write about Rhode Island. I said yes, and but partly it was to get over this sense of discomfort about your very opening. <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think what what was helpful about it is that um, it opened up the um, the setting of the lowland, which um, is set you know, in part in, in, in Rhode Island, but it's the first of my books in which I can actually mention Rhode Island by its name. Whereas the other books, the preceding books, um, are set in these sort of, you know, fake Rhode Island slash Massachusetts <laughs> kind of, you know, this area, this terrain that, that it really is Rhode Island, you know, to, you know, to, <laughs> just to boil it down. <laughs> Um, but I couldn't mention it. I couldn't name it as such. And I think it, that was, that's telling. It, it was saying something. The fact that in the earlier books I was, you know, I was writing about the ocean. I was writing about this kind of, you know, small campus, little town, and describing these settings that I knew very well, the settings I had grown up in. Um, but I couldn't come out and say that it was Rhode Island, and I kept calling it some suburb of Boston. Um, and, you know, so I, I think the writing of that piece, uh, unlocked something. And then in the lowland, they're in Rhode Island and I don't pretend anymore. We'll, we'll get to your most recent work, but one of the things I, I like the most about everything you've done is I always get the sense you're trying to work out some problem for yourself and also for us. But I'd like to sort of survey your, your whole writing life. And just start with the question, when you were young, when you were, say, 15 years old, what was your favorite novel and why? Um, well, I think I had started reading Russian literature around that age. Um, I had some friends, or some, or my family had friends um, with some, you know, one of the daughters, they had three daughters, one of them was a little bit older. Um, she was already in college, and so when <clears> I would visit them, I would see these big, volumes of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy on her desk, these Norton critical editions, that yes. they were really <laughs> appealing to me. Um, and so I think I, 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 I tried to kind of, you know, um, rise to 
another, you know, a, a, another level of, of reading. And, and um, so that's my, that's probably what I was, you know, reading a lot of. Um, I loved Hawthorne even then. Mm-hmm. Um, when, well, so I was in 10th grade and when I was 15. Um, I read The Great Gatsby uh, that year. Uh, and then the following year, I was introduced to Hardy, who has become so important to me as well. So it was in high school that I encountered, uh, fortunately, um, certain authors who have stayed with me uh, for, for all of this time and, and who continue to inspire me. Well, one of the things I've liked about just comments you've dropped is the way you read, say, Scarlet Letter is actually a novel of immigrants that maybe the characters wouldn't have behaved that way in, in a quote-unquote home country. Even a lot of Hardy, especially Tess, a favorite of yours, you can read as a kind of immigrant novel. Sure. Coming from the countryside, moving somewhere quite strange. And to use that as a lens for interpreting what otherwise might seem like strange character behaviors, but reading them through you is actually very rewarding, sort of through your eyes, through your fiction. Does that make sense to you at all? Yes, I mean, I, I think what I'm responding to is a sense of displacement in in those authors, in, in almost any author. I mean, even, you know, Willa Cather, you can read this way. Homer, you can read this way. So many authors, you can read this way, which is why I think some years ago I was asked this question um, by the New York Times Book Review about, you know, what was my problem with immigrant literature, and I made a kind of maybe cheeky remark about how I didn't believe in it, but this is, it wasn't being cheeky, it was just being, it was just saying what I felt was true, which is that this is something I've responded to in literature from the very beginning, Mm -hmm. and if I didn't have this response to literature, then, you know, these writers wouldn't have fed and inspired me the way they did, because there would have been a quote-unquote barrier between their experiences and their times um, and, and mine, and that, that shouldn't be the case, right? That's not what literature right. does. Literature does the opposite, and it allows us to cross over those boundaries in a beautiful way, in a magical way. Now, if I can trust the Internet, you have three master's degrees in creative writing, comparative literature, and English, and for one of your degrees, you translated six Bengali short stories by Asha Devi, who's a Bengali writer, maybe the most famous woman writer or even writer in Bengal for much of the 20th century. What connects you to her and so what problem were you trying to solve by engaging in her work? Well, um, I knew about her through my, through my mother, who is a, a devoted reader uh, of Asha Devi's work and talked about her a lot. Um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, I mean, my mother... Um, read a lot, but she didn't really read in English uh, very much at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, but she read in Bengali. And I remember the the effort of, uh, you know, going to Calcutta, um, ordering the books. Uh, my mother, the list she would give my uncle, uh, who had the connections with all the booksellers in, uh, on College Street in Calcutta, which is like the book kind of district, um, and the drama of this, you know, going and... Um, ordering all the books from the publishers and waiting and bringing them back, you know, in the rickshaw, piling them, the whole thing, and then bringing them back to the United States. Um, you know, I saw what it meant to her, uh, you know, and I, and I saw, I mean, as with everything, with trying to get the right ingredients, what have you, but the literature was, you know, I could see that those books simply weren't available here. Um, and they were in some sense, you know, um, her lifeline. Um, Anyway, so she would talk about these, uh, she would talk about the work of this particular author, among others, and and I was struck uh, by the things she described, you know, a very prolific author of short stories and novels, um, of some very um, incisive short stories about um, kind of domestic life um, and uh, sort of classified unfairly, I think, as a you know a, a, a writer for women, which I don't think she is at all. I think she has a much you know more universal power um, and and vision. Anyway, um, in graduate school, I was taking this translation workshop, and um, so the 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 assignment at some point I I was asked to translate 
something. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, what can I do here? Um, and, um, you know, I had studied Latin and ancient Greek a little bit, and I had some French, um, and, and then I had Bengali as my, you know, first language. Uh, but you didn't read but Bengali, I, but I couldn't, Bengali characters. I, I so. couldn't read it, and I still really can't, um, and I couldn't and re- write in it either, um, and I still really can't. Um, and, and yet I, uh, I worked around this obvious obstacle, um, and I asked my mother to read uh, a number of these stories out loud, and I taped her. And then I listened to them and, you know, kept playing them back, playing them back, and I translated in this way. Um, and, I, and I can read enough, um, I mean, painful, painstakingly, slowly, but I can, I, I have, you know, it's not completely incomprehensible to me, um, so that I could then also go back, in addition to the tapes, the, the, you know, the, um, I could also look at the text and sort of see how, things were structured, um, where the breaks were, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I even caught my mother a couple of times. She kind of skipped, you know, (laughs) a paragraph here and there. And I would call her up and say, what about this part where she's describing, you know? Um, so it was a really interesting project and I, um, but that's how it, that's how it, um, how it started. There's something about how she sets her stories in architectural space always that reminds me of your writings. When you, when you have a scene, you, you describe a home very often or the place in advance, and that's imposing a structure on the scene, and that's in her. Do you get that from her? Um, well, I think I wrote, the, in the commentary I wrote to the thesis, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, this was a lifetime ago, but um, I think that was part of the, the lens I brought to my reading, to my critical reading of the stories, was that she was a writer very attuned to space, to physical space. Um, and, uh, and so I must have been affected by this in some sense. And then my doctoral dissertation kind of built on this in that um, I wrote about um, Jacobean English drama and where it was set, uh, specifically often in a corrupt Italian palazzo, yes. and so what that meant. So, I, so I think as a as a reader of, of literature, when I was a student of literature, I was very attuned to um, where things were set and why, um, and what it meant. Um, you know, to have that you know that that literal architecture uh, uh, being an element of of narrative. Now, we're at George Mason University, and George Mason, the man, he lived in a place called Gunston Hall. And that's one of the best-known examples of Palladian architecture in Virginia, even the whole Atlantic seaboard. So you did a PhD dissertation on Renaissance studies. And what is it about Palladianism and Palladio that, that drew your attention? What, what, what's the magnet there for you? Well, I mean, something's just, you know, now that you ask me, um, <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, so what led me to this? Um, one of the classes, again, that I was taking as a graduate student was um, a, a class, um, a seminar. Um, it was sort of a broad seminar with lots of different professors. Anyway, so I, there was this one professor um, named Roger Scruton, who sure, writes a I lot about architecture. I had a debate with him once on okay. the nature of friendship. Yes, he, he's very... <laughs> I won. Um, <laughs> congratulations. Um, yeah, I mean, he's a very well-spoken man. Sure. Um, and with a broad range of interests, um, aesthetics, philosophy, um, architecture. Anyway, and he, um, he taught part of this class and talked about the language of architecture, uh, Italian architecture in particular, um, and I was, I just was really struck by the class, the, uh, the, the idea of it, um, looking at space so carefully, um, these beautiful spaces, what they meant, the vocabulary implicit in architecture. Um, so that was sort of step one. And then, um, 
And then I went to Florence in this time. I, I went to Italy for the first time. I went to Florence with the, you know, and not only did it lead to this whole other sort of phase of my life, uh, Italian, writing in Italian, but um, it was, I, I went with a, with a special eye toward the architecture um, looking at the places that I was seeing in slides, you know, as a grad student in Boston and um, connecting to them for the first time, really experiencing them, those spaces for the first time. Um, and then when I came, you know, then when I was reading these plays, um, I mean, I was always interested in um, where Shakespeare said his plays. I was interested in his use of, it, of Italy as a setting. And then that just sort of got me started thinking about what was the relationship of, um, you know, in Renaissance England, you know, what, what, what was it all about and what did, what did Italy represent to those, to that, to, to, to England and to English artists, dramatists, and what, why, what was this choice all about? Um, why were they setting clearly kind of English political drama in, in, on foreign soil and, and what that meant? Um, and they're also afraid of Italy, right? It's right. a symbol of corruption. It's, it's a sort of a, a horror, love, horror, kind of love, hate, you know, attraction, repulsion, right. um, contradictory, you know, um, uh, attitude, uh, which I tried to unpack a little bit in the, in the course of the dissertation. So it's still working through some set of related problems in a way. Yeah, and I think one thing that's always sort of in there is this idea of translation and bringing back and crossing mm -hmm. over, you know. Um, I mean, one thing certainly that was happening in the Renaissance was that these, you know, people were literally traveling to Venice, to Florence, to Rome, and seeing this architecture, which is sort of, you know, born from that place, and then bringing those ideas back, translating the works of, you know, Vitruvius or Alberti or whomever, um, and then using those ideas to build, literally to build buildings in England. And then from there, we have things here mm -hmm. um, in the United States. So that also interested me. To continue the whirlwind tour of your career, in preparing for this, I reread Interpreter of Maladies. And this was the sense I had this time around, that one of your characters, Mr. Capassi, who is the interpreter of maladies, so if people come to the doctor and they only speak Gujarati, he's able to translate that for the doctor and explain what the symptoms are, that in a sense, in the book, you view yourself, the author, as the interpreter of maladies, so people who are disconnected in different ways, and you're the one doing the interpreting, and he's at the center of the book, and he's a stand-in for you. Is that just my imagination? Probably not, uh, but I don't think I was aware of it at the time, you yeah. know. I mean, I, I think um, just yesterday I was um, I was talking in, in Princeton to um, at a place called Dorotea's House, which is sort of dedicated to Italian-American culture, so on, and we were talking about um, the most recent book and, um, and talking about, uh, at one point I was talking about this idea of, um, you know, in, 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 in antiquity, um, in Latin, uh, the word for translator is interpreter. Mm -hmm. And I teach translation now. And, you know, I, I talk a lot to my students about translation being the most intimate form of reading and how there was a, there was, you know, there was the time when translating and interpreting and analyzing sort of were all one one thing and now there are translators and then there are people who look at books and analyze them and are scholars and etc and there's not it's not necessarily you know the same activity um and it strikes me because now many years i mean so i wrote interpreter of maladies that was my first book i called it that i heard the title in this strange you know flash um and and now years later, years have gone by, and I have I I'm now just setting out on a new phase of my creative life as a translator, um, and so I think it's all one continuum. But I just wasn't one can't see one can't realize these things in the moment. You know, you have to. It's only looking back that you kind of see certain patterns. Another thing that struck me about this book. 
was how much it had in common with Elena Ferrante in some ways. And of course, this is at a time when you wouldn't have read her yet. But this notion of both feeling a need to set everything right for so many different people and being unable to, and that carrying a kind of sadness, and then interjected into the story always are books. So books both have this immense power, like everyone's reading them, everyone's looking to them for answers. And yet at the same time, books are somehow impotent because they don't actually allow anyone to actually set everything right for parents or other sets of people. And she has a bit of that, and you have a bit of that. And of course, it's completely independent. Uh, but your later fascination with her seems already to be an interpreter of maladies in some ways. Does that make sense to you? Well, I certainly recognize that in her work when I read her. Um, and I wrote to her, I wrote some letters. Um, I, I wrote two letters to her that were sort of public letters that I read uh, in Rome some years ago um, uh, in public. Um, and maybe she was there or maybe she wasn't. <laughs> um, in any case, she did write back to me. Um, and, uh, and I talked precisely about this. I talked about, um, you know, how she uses, how she, how she, how books are characters in her work. Um, and the, 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 you know, I think her work in some sense is about, um, about reading and about language and, and literature and what it means, um, you know, on a very deep level, a very sophisticated level. I don't think my work is doing that at all, but, um, but, but I, I think about it a lot. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I, I was very struck by, by, by that element of her, uh, of her work and, you know, this focus on, uh, characters who write, um, characters who become writers, um, you know, how books shape and form us and, and, ha at, and on the one hand and how they, you know, betray us on the other hand and can't really contain what life is, um, this sort of contradiction um, at heart. Now, if you compare Interpreter of Maladies to your other short story collection, Unaccustomed Earth, do you think of the latter, more recent work as being more about reconciliation and there's a greater role for children or families in at least some of the stories? Or do you think overall your fiction with time is moving in the direction of Hardy and becoming darker? I think it's becoming darker and I think that's usually the, the case, the case yes. as we get older, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so I think that and I, I, that's my sense, and I, I feel that, um, you know, though I really try not to uh, read a lot about what people say about my work, um, I also don't live in a vacuum in outer space, and so I, I sense, you know, reactions to, to certain things, right? And I, I think, um, you know, as, as the years have gone by and, and the books have you know, evolved, um, you know, uh, the vision has, has become a little less forgiving, less tolerant, um, um, a little less bittersweet and more just maybe bitter. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's fine. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I remember even with the lowland, um, you know, I and I, I don't think my editor would mind if I share this with you, but at, at one point she said, um, well, it's just really grim sometimes, you know, what goes on. And I and, and we had, you know, we, we share a, a love of Hardy. And I just said, would you really have said that to Hardy? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she didn't say anything else, you know. Um, <laughs> but and, and so I published the book I wanted to publish. But a lot of people have said to me, I just couldn't read the book, you know. Um, it was just too heavy, too dark, too whatever, whatever. And they miss, they miss, I think, um, the, the sort of bittersweet quality of, 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 say, a novel like The Namesake. You bring up Lowland. I'd like to ask you a few questions about Bengal. If someone's visiting India and they ask me for advice, 
I say you simply absolutely must go to Calcutta. Uh, if you, to the extent you feel the same way, how would you articulate why it is people ought to go visit Calcutta? Because it's one of the most fascinating places on earth that is, um, you know, I, I, I mean, it's just a city that uh, is like no other um, with a, with a, with a, um, you know, um, a life, a cultural life, a history, uh, utterly its own and hard uh, and beautiful. Um, I mean, its beauty is not what one, you know, sort of conventional, you know, people say, oh, well, is it a beautiful city? <laughs> well, well, no. I mean, yes, parts of it can be, yes, of course, um, but but not in that conventional sense. Um, and it's 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 challenging on a whole host of levels and i i of course you know i don't know it as a tourist right because my family's from there and i've never known it in any other way other than when i was very young where my grandparents lived and then my aunts and uncles and my cousins and so forth um so i have my own relationship to it um but um you know it's it's it it has its it's it's like it's like not knowing New York City uh in the American context. I mean it just it's 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 just its own thing and it's so strong in its flavor and its power um and its energy. Um so, you know, um it, it has to be reckoned with, you know, um I think and uh if I think of Indian economists, the two of the best known would be Amartya Sen and Abhijit Banerjee, and they're both Bengali, of course. Why does it seem that so much of the Indian intelligentsia comes from Calcutta or Bengal? What is it in the water, so to speak? I don't know. I mean, um, I just, I know that they're, I mean, I hate to make these kind of sweeping generalized, generalized comments. I don't believe in them, but um, but but you know, uh, it's a city that believes in its poets. Um, that that is a uh, believes in its politics, uh, believes in its believes in humanity in some sense, um, and uh, and 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 life is so extreme there. Uh, in so many ways, um, people are put to the test, and, and you see life being put to the test constantly around you. And, and there's nothing you can really accept, you know, easily or take for granted about yourself or about the universe if you've been there. You know, I mean, it just—it's a jolt um, to to your consciousness, and uh, but a, but a, but a fundamental one, an, an essential one. You know, to to shake us out of this, whatever takes over if you protect yourself. Now, if I were to take a, a superficial reading of Indian history, earlier Calcutta is the central capital for the British Empire in India. And you could argue that as the British left India since World War II, Calcutta has become significantly less central in some ways. Delhi and Mumbai seem to become more important. A, do you think that's true? And B, if it is true, do you think that actually in part accounts for why Calcutta has stayed so interesting. That loss of centrality or existing on the margins, you even have a nice Italian word for this. Well, um, I think it's, it's, it's retained a certain character that um, uh, the other big cities, um, you know, have, have, have a more kind of Western overlay at this point. You know, um, I mean, Calcutta is not, far behind and it's changed radically from you know the city i knew when i was a young girl um and now i think with you know developments globalization what have you um you know you have lots of development and all the five star hotels you could ever want and all the companies and banks and things and fancy roads and you know all of that stuff that Back in the 70s, you know, Calcutta didn't have those things. And then the airport was, you know, distinctly not glamorous and any, all of these things, you know. So you, you, you felt 
you know, okay, this is a different kind of experience. Um, not, um, not designed for the tourist, not designed for the important person, you know, um, shall we say. Um, but, and, and so now, so that has already changed, and that, that distance is smaller, um, significantly smaller. But in, in some sense, you know, yes, I think it still retains its own particular flavor and energy uh, because of this, maybe. And how emotionally tied do you feel to the earlier history? So in 1905, Curzon partitions what is now West Bengal, Bengal, from what is now Bangladesh. And you can easily imagine some alternate history where that hadn't happened. And the way the national borders would have been divvied up would be quite different from what we see. Is that just abstract history to you, the way you know, I might read about the English Renaissance, or is that something that has emotional oomph in your mind, in your heart, and you, you, you feel somehow torn as a Bengali that you've been separated from other Bengalis in some way, or is it just not part of your connection to West Bengal? Well, um, I mean, it, it's interesting. My, my relationship with Indian history is kind of in these two two categories in some sense. I mean, in some sense, you know, I didn't study any of it because I was raised here, right? And right. so India just wasn't on any map anywhere ever. Um, <laughs> and um, so there was that, you know, there was a sort of formal separation um, as, 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 a, as a child growing up in this country when I was growing up. Um, on the other hand, you know, I come from my family and I, because we would go back to Calcutta quite often and because um, my family and their friends, um, you know, talked a lot about um, their country, their city, history, events. Um, so I was always aware at the same time of um, these incredibly traumatic events um, in, in Indian history and the, and the, the partition uh, uh, most of all, uh, what that meant, um, particularly for my father's family, um, the neighborhood that my father grew up in, which I describe, uh, in, in the lowland, um, a little bit. Um, I, uh, you know, I was, I, I, I asked my parents when I was a young girl, you know, we, the, the, this, one of the stories in Interpretive Malady is called When Mr. Pirzada comes to dine, comes from a kind of vague memory of a man from Bangladesh, a scholar who was living in, in Rhode Island in the 1970s during that civil war, and, and my curiosity about who he was and why he was there and, and stories my parents told me. Um, and, and then as I grew older, as I, as I became more of a conscious, you know, person, teenager, wondering about things, I would going back to India, you know, I, I, I was start slowly starting to fill in sort of pieces like, okay, so this is what happened and it happened this, it happened at this time and then this, and this is what, you know, this meant this wave of people came and all of these people, um, you know, lived this thing. Um, but, but on top of that, there's the, there's the residue, there's the emotional residue of what it's meant for certain people um, either in my family or people that my family knows um, who remain um, deeply scarred by those events and not only deeply scarred but uh, actively hostile, resentful um, uh, toward, uh, you know, for the case of my family, uh, toward, toward East Bengal and Muslims, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and and so this was something that I, you know, I took in um, and I still take in um, and and that uneasy relationship between Hindus and Muslims uh, in, in Bengali culture, right, um, right, is still very alive uh, today. And, um, you know, my my daughter, uh, her name is Noor, uh, which is a Persian name. Um, but you know, um, there were, there were people in my family who commented on that choice of name, um, thinking, well, 
you know, what does she think she's doing? Because it's Persian. Because it's, it's associated with Muslims and et cetera, et cetera, and this kind of hatred, intolerance, prejudice, you know, um, that is what I'm saying is it's still, it's something that's still very much in my, in my family's kitchen, in their, in their, at their dinner table. I mean, my parents are, are not like that at all, right? And they, they taught me to have, you know, to be free of these kinds of um, attitudes. But, you know, perhaps that's easier for me to say because I didn't experience the trauma of losing my family, losing, losing their ancestral property, for right. example, you know, which some, some of their friends experienced. And therefore, even now in 2016, they're still, you know, saying, oh, but, you know, this horrible thing happened and, you know, we're still upset about it. So what, what's your literary or maybe even also emotional relationship with the works of Tagore? So he's a towering giant in Bengali intellectual history. In your stories, every now and then, someone's reading his poems. Uh, there's a lot of themes from him that, that are in your work, like home and the world, this odd mix of tensions between the cosmopolitan and the particular. He was even interested in book design. He was a kind of polymath. He mm -hmm. studied many things, worked in different forms. Is that just parallel or an influence or... Well, I mean, I think if you're Bengali, you just, he's like a member of your family in mm -hmm. some sense, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, he's a god. He's, you know, in this pantheon-like place, right? Um, I mean, he's not a god, he's a person. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, for, for, for people, I mean, my, my parents, again, they, they aren't religious people, so they didn't give us an, a religious education, but they... They certainly taught us to respect the great, the great minds and the great visionaries, and so so Tagore is one of those, right? Um, and the fact that he happens to be Bengali and won the Nobel Prize, well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> details. Um, but you know, I mean, I my um, my grandfather was a painter, my uncle was a painter. Um, I grew up with portraits of Tagore all over our house. I have a portrait of him. Um, in my uh, in my house, uh, painted by a watercolor by my uncle, I have a beautiful photograph my mother dug up recently. Of um, so, my my grandfather's brother was a press photographer, and he um, took the last he took the a picture of Tagore and his at his last public um, you know the last time he spoke in public, and so I have this photograph that's just next to me when I'm writing. Um, so I feel this kind of, you know, this constant presence, uh, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, again, my limitation in not really being a flu fluent reader of of Bengali is, you know, it is it creates a situation. It does. I mean, I've read him in mostly in translation. I've read fiction. I've read poetry. I grew up hearing all of the songs like 24 hours a day in yeah. my house. Um, <laughs> So, you know, um, but I don't, I'm not aware of any kind of conscious influence, if that's what you're asking. But again, what's conscious, what's unconscious? Now let's move to maybe what's my favorite book of yours. In other words, which I take to be your memoir of learning to engage with both reading Italian, dealing with Italian culture, and most of all, writing in Italian, a remarkably brave thing to do. And it, it comes off extremely well. I'm just going to toss out the names of a few Italian writers, the, the lesser known ones. And if you have a connection to them, tell us why you think they're interesting or how they've shaped you in some way. Uh, feel free to pass on anyone, of course. Lala Romano. Okay. Um, well, I had never heard of her until I was living in Rome and I just was reading the paper one day um, and read an article about her, uh, and it was interesting. Uh, I took a note. I took note of it. I took note of the name, um, and I went to the bookshop, and I said, I'd like to read this author, and they said, oh, yeah, she's sort of hard to find, you know, kind of not that well distributed. Um, anyway, so I ordered some books, and... Um, and uh, 
And in fact, what I did, uh, because it was so hard to find the books, um, I, you know, I, I went through the person who wrote, this is Italy, right? Everybody knows everybody. So I, the person who wrote the article, I knew. So I said, you know, how do I get these books? And he said, well, what you need to do is you need to write to her husband who has all the books, <laughs> you know, he has like a warehouse in his, in their house. Um, oh. and I said, okay. So I wrote the husband. Um, and so there was some back and forth and then he sent me, um, a packet of books from, from Milano, from Milan, and they never made it to Rome. You know, <laughs> happens. They're still on a train somewhere. Yes. <laughs> so I waited. I waited for these books, and they weren't coming. And then I said, listen, these books, I know you kindly sent them. but um, And then one thing led to another, and I was, I found myself in Milan. And again, I kind of reignited this um, uh, interest. And he said, well, why don't you come over? Um and then I went to her house, um, and I saw her house where she used to live, and we had a you know very interesting conversation. Um, I saw her desk, I saw her things, I saw her paintings, um, and he gave me all of her books, like <laughs> you know, like a cart full of her books, um, and that was really exciting. Um, but no, so I and anyway, so I started reading her. Um, with great interest, um, I mean, she's an incredibly sort of modernist writer in some sense. Her language is um, incredible, uh, essential in its quality. Um, she wrote um, uh, an extraordinarily powerful book uh, that I, you know, if, if there's, you know, if life is long enough uh, and there's time, I would like to translate, um, called Neymari Estremi, and it's... Um, it's a sort of two-part um, uh, um, memoir um, of her of losing her husband, and and you know there's so many books now about grief and the loss of a loved one and what that means, and um, but this was something she, that was written a long time ago before all these books became kind of part of our cultural culture. Um, so so that's an amazing book of her. She wrote a lot of interesting, very interesting novels. She um She wrote about homecomings to places that don't exist anymore. She also. she did. Um and then one of the things that uh also really struck me um was at the end of her life she was almost blind. Um and uh and still the drive to write was so intense and constant. And, um, so her husband, her second husband, you know, the one who survives her, um, was, you know, was explaining that when, when she was in the final phase of her life, um, and could barely see, she would, you know, she had these enormous pieces of paper basically, and, and would just sort of write a couple of words, a, a sentence or two a day, like this, and these very kind of, kind of, the words were just burning with with life and and with her need to express herself um in spite of the the the, the disability and um and these these writings were collected in um in a book called the last diary um which i read and there's a one of her they're almost like little um you know fragments um epigrams some of these little entries and one of them says um in Italian, it says, la mia cecità è un punto di vista, which means my blindness is a point of view. And um, and I was really, um, I really marveled at that because I felt like it kind of explained, at least to me, um, the, the purpose of writing in Italian. Because, of course, she wasn't totally blind. She was partially blind, and, and I'm not totally blind in Italian either, but I feel kind of partially blind. Now, I don't want to compare myself to her because she had actually a physical, you know, uh, issue with her eyesight and she would, didn't choose that for herself um, and she suffered for it, whereas my project is something that comes from me and it's voluntary, but it is this kind of voluntary blindness, right? But it's richer for you to read in Italian and maybe even sometimes to write in Italian now 
because yes. the partial blindness gives you a new lens on all these problems you've been trying to come to terms with. Well, it makes you since, look harder. Yeah. Right. Another writer, Cesare Pavese. Well, um, Pavese is huge, you know. He, he translated Moby Dick. And um, <laughs> my, we were in Sicily a couple of years ago, and the, um, we were sailing around the Aeolian Islands, and we had this long conversation one day with our skipper um, about how, according to him, Pavese's translation of Moby Dick surpasses the work of <laughs> Melville. <laughs> Um, and does it? Well, I, you know, I actually haven't read it yet. It, I would like to. I keep meaning to pick it up when I'm over there. Um, but uh, but he was he was you know a colossal colossal writer from um, from Turin, uh, that great literary city uh, where you have um, Primo Levi, Natalia Ginzburg, um, Einaudi, the the publishing house. Um, you know, all concentrated in this part of uh, Italy in the north over toward France. And, um, and Pavese wrote uh, very much in the um, autobiographical vein um, and did things that, you know, again, I think now it's, oh, it's fashionable when the writer becomes a character and, oh, we all write about ourselves and there's a lot of <laughs> memoir and things. But these are pe things that he was doing, you know, in, um, after World War II. You know, he had a tragic life. He suffered deeply. Um, he committed suicide. Um, he left behind an incredible um, sort of writer's notebook um, uh, that is an extraordinarily powerful uh, work. Um, you know, very, very dark, very, uh, very true. Um, and uh, wrote lots of short stories, uh, as well as, um, you know, a series of kind of slim novels. Um, and he worked really hard as a translator, uh, not only tr his own translations um, of many American authors, um, had a very rich relationship with the English language, um, uh, but also sort of over oversaw a lot of translation projects, um, he writes like an American writer in some ways. It, well, he was influenced. I mean, this is what's interesting. He was influenced by reading and translating um, Melville, among others, and 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 his Italian has a different energy as a result of that translation. And I think those translations and and his relationship with English. And I think um, I think this is what's kind of missing in American literature right now, in some sense. I mean, I. I, I feel like, um, with the exception of, of poets, American poets, who who have um, devoted time and energy to other literatures, to translation, whether it's Ezra Pound or other poets, um, W.S. Merman, Mark Strand. I mean, you have examples of people who, who translate and make that part of their creative work, but um, relatively very few fiction writers um, stop to think about it. Um, <laughs> Or or, and, or or engage with it, you know. Um, and so, but but I think um, my my you know knowledge now of of, of Italian writers um, um, has opened up something because I I think you know for me I mean I just finished translating my first novel from Italian and it has been such a formative experience for me and and um, and and powerful and and just deepened my awareness of what, of what words are in literature and language and all of that. It's just been, I kind of can't believe it's taken me this long, you know, but I'm excited. And, um, uh, but I think someone like Pavese was like, you know, blazed the way uh, in some sense. One of my wishes is that you someday give us a book on Italian fiction. And here's a writer, not Italian, but writing in another language, not the mother tongue, Agota Kristoff. Yes, amazing. What's important? You have her book there. Yes. Um, well, she is... And that's a trilogy, right? Um, yeah, she wrote this trilogy, and she wrote some other books, too. Um, so she was Hungarian and left um, during the invasion to fled to Switzerland with her small kids, her husband, and her dictionaries. 
um, and writes about this in an amazing little book called The, um, the Illiterate, Analfabeta. I read it in Italian. It must be called something else in French, um, Analfabet. But, um, but she taught herself how to write in French. Um, and, um, and all of her literary work is, is in French. Uh, in, and I read her, uh, I, I came to her in Italian, so I came to her in translation, but not in an English translation, in an Italian translation. And my life was never the same after reading her. I mean, she's just one of those readers you just, you, you, you remain forever altered. Um, uh, extraordinarily powerful, a deep, uh, uh, profound, profound writer, um, uh, dark and, but very human. Um, and the, just the kind of stuff that you don't, you know, find very easily. Um, uh, anyway, but she is, you know, inspiring to me, um, deeply because of her, because of this incredible effort she made her whole life to try to express herself in a learned language. Mm -hmm. Um, now of course the difference between her, um, and, and, and myself, uh, is, uh, is that she, I think she always had a sort of antagonistic relationship with French, even though she went out of her way to learn it and to express herself in it because she was living in Switzerland and she felt that she couldn't really function as a writer without expressing herself in French, whereas I've sort of gone out of my way uh, to do this crazy thing that everyone discourages me, discourages me from doing, which is writing in Italian. And you were fascinated you know? with Italy way back when, right? For well, a long time. Yeah, I mean, in a growing way. Yeah. 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 Now, your most recent book, The Clothing of Books, it's about book covers. So I once had a hypothesis about book covers and I thought I would go to a Borders bookstore when it still existed and look at everything on the front table and try to ignore all other information I had about the book and simply buy the one whose cover appealed to me the most. And I wanted to see whether the publishing trade actually would do a good job of designing a cover so that it would match what I was looking for in a book. And I ended up buying What's Kate you? Christensen's The Great Man, which I thought was quite a good novel. Okay. And I only did that once, but I considered the experiment to be a success. <laughs> so do you think, based on your study of book covers, your own books aside, but are book covers assigned to books efficiently, or is there something in the process that's gone wrong? Well, I mean, I've never, I've never tried this experiment. I will, maybe. Um, <laughs> It's hard to block out all the other information because you recognize names, sure. publishing houses, where yeah. they put it on the table, yeah. but still, you yeah. can approximate it. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk a little bit in this little essay about being drawn to certain books just because there's some allure, appeal, something I'm projecting, something the book is projecting, something I'm projecting onto the book, some relationship I want to have with the book because it's, I don't know, some landscape I want to find myself in someday or... I don't know, you know, um, I mean, if you think of a book as a, as a mirror, right. And if you just sort of think, well, that's how I would like to look if I were a tree or if I were a whatever, you know, some image. Um, um, but I, you know, no, the, the, the essay w is really about, um, the disconnect, uh, between what's on the outside and what's on the inside often and, and what, that feels like from a writer's point of view, um, because it's both a disconnect and a source of, can be at least for me, a source of real anguish, because you can't really disconnect yourself from what you look like, you know? Sure. You can try, but you can't really, you know? Like when I read A Customed Earth, and if I try to think of it as a kind of song cycle, I try to put the cover out of my mind, because I know how the covers are done and assigned, and I figure, well, the cover will mislead me because you didn't do it. But I find I can't put it out of my mind, even being aware of the entire process. And there's something about, you know, the floating tiara or crown or whatever it is. It leaves an imprint on my impression of the book, even though I know it's not by you. Mm -hmm. It's this. 
It's that. Oh, yeah. you have it on. Yeah. Yeah. That's. I think that's what they they literally designed it after. That. Yeah. So it's a very um, pretty cover, but maybe it's too pretty. I think. Well, <laughs> I, I'm not going to get in any trouble. Um, any more trouble than I'm you, already in. How um, do you feel about blurbs? <laughs> well, I. I mean, I say what I feel about blurbs in the in the essay. Um, you know, some of my publishers have been a little uncomfortable about publishing that sentence in my book, actually. Um, because I just say what I feel, and I think this is what one of the things about writing in Italian that people aren't prepared for is that I actually don't pretend anymore. Um, and I try not to, you know, I, I'm not concerned about making everybody happy. Um, but, um, but no, I mean, one of the things I say in the book, in this essay, is that I actually can't, these books don't even, I mean, I, as much as I appreciate truly this this lovely display that you made but I this isn't my book anymore you know this once the cover is on it it's not my book and again I mean having lived in in Italy and having Italian friend, writer friends um, so many examples of novels there have covers chosen by the author imagine that <laughs> but you know but it, but suddenly you 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 have a whole you know, you have the inside, you have the words, you have the pages that the author created, and you actually, you have an image that the author felt that they wanted, he or she wanted to represent visually what the book is saying. I mean, if I had that freedom, if I had that ability, I would be such a happy, you know, it, it would make making to going to museums even more exciting <laughs> because I would always be thinking, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe this, maybe that, um, you know, who knows, maybe an image could even inspire a book in that sense. If, I ha if one had that ability to say, oh, you know what, I, I went to this show, this gallery the other day, and I saw this image, and it was so beautiful, and I, I was thinking about it, and this whole novel grew out of it, or this whole collection of stories, or whatever. These things can happen. They just don't happen here um, as much as I wish they did. Um, I, I brought a copy of a German book. It's by Rilke. The publisher is Reklam. The cover is plain, mm -hmm. it's just a color, and if you go to German bookstores, at least parts of them, they're actually organized by publishers, yeah. you probably know, other countries in like Europe in, sometimes. Like in Italy too, in France, And the yeah. books more or less all look the same. How do you feel about this system? I love them. So you would opt yeah. into this system yeah. for Yeah, well, I mean, I, I talk about that in the book. I mean, I talk, the whole piece is a kind of, you know, meditation on the idea of wearing a uniform and, and dressing yourself, and how this, you know, these contradictory uh, approaches, right, to, 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 to presenting oneself, what they mean. Um, it's like you have to make a statement about where you've decided to rest in the, uh, on the identity question, and a cover forces your hand in a way you'd rather be hovering in this ambiguity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, prefer, I prefer this kind of cover, because to me, there's a protective quality to the lack of specificity and the, and the and the belonging to the the you know the series, which is what Europe you know. I mean, in in the U.S., you have certain series as well. And um, in fact, I was thinking. I mean, I wrote the essay when I was in Rome, and I was far away from my American library and my books and things. But now that I'm back here and I unpacked a lot of my books. Um, I mean, there are certain presses here that, that have that uh, aesthetic philosophy. Um, you know, City Lights Books makes those beautiful little books of like my copy of Allen Ginsberg's Howl and et cetera. I mean, these are beautiful books, um, American books that all kind of looked the same, similar dimensions, have a kind of sober quality, um, a lot of emphasis on type. Um, so I won't say that it doesn't happen here, but I think for like the average writer and the average publisher, it's a very different dialogue that's happening when it comes to putting a book, uh, putting a cover onto a book. And um, and so I think if I had to choose, I would choose that the safety of the uniform because, of course, I mean the the whole piece, the whole little essay, whatever begins with a with the memory of being a child and being traumatized by having to dress myself um, because it just churned up so many problems uh, and, and was a source of 
true anguish for me as a child to have to put on my, to choose clothes and put them on. And this has, this has economic ramifications. This has um, cultural ramifications. This has all sorts of ramifications because clothes are, you know, things we buy in stores and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, so I had this sort of crazy, uh, you know, um, envy, admiration, envy, obsession uh, with my cousin's school uniforms in Calcutta um, because they were all the same. And they just put on what they had to wear to school every day and it was the same thing. And I, and I dreamed about that. I dreamed of being able to wake up in the United States and just putting on my blue skirt and my white shirt and my black shoes and going to school and nobody um, commenting on what I was wearing um, because I was always so terrified because people were always commenting on what I was wearing and, you know, either teasing me or whatever. Um, and, and, and so in that sense, you know, I think there's this kind of, you know, where do you stand between wanting to express yourself and be free, you know, and, and, and being afraid of that freedom um, and being, being actually vulnerable to that freedom. Um, I mean, I, I think America represents freedom with a big capital F and it always has, and we hope it always will <laughs> for the good. Um, but there's also the danger of that in that, you know, I mean, even as a young girl in the seventies, as a kid, immigrant, you know, child of immigrants, I knew what it meant to shop in one store versus another store. I saw what the girls in my class were wearing, the kinds of shoes, the kinds of purses. I knew that my parents weren't taking me to those stores, that they thought that was a waste of money and that we're not going to pay all of this $40 for Nike sneakers or whatever it is because it's a waste and you're going to grow out of them in six months. You know, whereas my other schoolmates had these things and suddenly there was the gap between me and them reinforced by these things. Mm -hmm. And I think for a child, at least for me, these things were traumatizing. Um, and I imagine for others as well. Two yeah. last questions before we get to q and I'll give them both to you together. First, what do you love most in Indian classical music? And second, what are you working on next? Well, um, again, from my mother, I, I inherited, received... Um, learn to appreciate uh, Indian classical uh, um, music, most of all sitar music, um, which she's always been passionate about, and my family, my, my, all my uncles, my great uncles, my cousins. I mean, I come from a broad, extended family, you know, passionate enthusiasts of, of, um, of, of um, the saro, mostly the, the instrument of uh, Ali Akbar Khan and Amzad Ali Khan, and you know, so I grew up my whole life um, uh, listening to this very complex, uh, beautiful music um, that is, you know, really has spoken to me. Uh, and just the other day, I was in uh, the Princeton Art Museum. There's a beautiful uh, exhibit there right now, um, which it's not that far. I really do recommend uh, a big collection of miniatures, two big rooms of extraordinary works, and one of the one of the whole chambers of this exhibit is is dedicated to like miniatures, basically d inspired by the the rog cycles. And there was like some there were headphones, and I put them on, and I was listening to one of them, and. You know, it's just a part of that music is a part of me, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I really am very, uh, you know, it's sort of part of my my formation. I think it's extraordinary. And your um, next work? Uh, well, um, my next work. Uh, so I have two kind of things that are happening. One is um, uh, so I just translated this novel uh, called um, Ties in English. It's Lachi is the Italian title uh, by Domenico Starnone, um, who is my friend and whom I consider the finest Italian living author. Um, and I just translated this novel. I'm just at the final stages, and it will be out in March. Uh, I think it's an amazing novel. I read it two years ago when it was first published. I'm so grateful for um, the opportunity to have brought it into English um, I'm really excited about it. And, uh, and, um, and then on the other side, I am slowly 
quietly writing some short, very short stories in Italian. Jhumpa Lahiri, thank you very much. Four questions, cue at the two mics. Please keep in mind, these are questions, not statements. If you go on and on, I will cut you off, and we will uh, alternate mics. Natasha. Um, I was hoping you would ask about it, but and I think everybody asks about it, and maybe it's not such an interesting question anymore, but it's interesting to me, and I'm hoping you would answer. Um, you mentioned that you really like Yelena Ferrante, and we all do too, at least most of us. And I wanted to hear your take on all this anonymity situation and uh, whether you think um, right now, is it considered in Italy that everybody really knows who she is after all these um, articles which came out? Or is it still a mystery? And just what's your take on the whole situation? Well, um, I think the whole situation is, you know, completely blown out of proportion and 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 ridiculous. Um, I I know personally the person who has been accused of being Elena Ferrante. Um, um, or uh, she's actually the wife of Domenico Sarnone, um, who has also been, you know, accused, whatever uh, the word is. I mean, it, it is like a trial, though. I mean, and this is the absurd thing, because whoever wrote those books did nothing wrong, uh, and it's been treated almost as if it were a crime. Um, and the nature of the article, uh, the very violent article, an appropriate article that was published a couple of months ago, um, that the language of that was very disturbing and uh, offensive to me. Um, whoever wrote those books, uh, the world is not no better off knowing who the actual person is. And I think, you know, we've all completely lost perspective in that, you know, so many beautiful things have been created by mankind that we still go to look at and marvel at or read or whatever the case may be. And nobody's hung up on who exactly the person was and what their name was and when their what their birthday is or you know this whole cult of the individual and the individual's hand and signature behind what's being done. Um, these are kind of recent concepts if you think about them. Um, so I mean, and again, people in in Italy just. They don't care about this, you know. I mean, they have their own things. They have other things to think about and worry about at this point. So this whole Ferrante thing, you know, I mean, it, the article came out. You know, I exchanged some messages with my friends saying, you know, this is just disgusting and why and so unnecessary. And then everybody moved on, whereas I think here in America it's become, it's just going, it's just ongoing and it never, it's, it's just not dying. It's not, people aren't moving on and saying, you know, let's just either read the books or not read the books. But, you know, if someone goes out of their way to say, you know, I would like to write with anonymity, why why that can't be respected in our culture is uh, really a kind of, you know, mystifying to me um, and also distressing in terms of, you know, what, what that means. Um, and the projection people have uh, onto the idea of, 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 you know, who the the writer might be and the reasons and you know all of this speculation, which which it, it could be a very simple, simple thing, you know, um, but it's it's become it's become kind of contorted. I feel like in, this, in at least in in the United States, maybe in England, I don't know, uh, but it's not the same in, in in Italy. People aren't really talking about it. In the same way. Next question. Um, hello, uh, Ms. Uh, Lahiri. I admire your writing. I'll start with this, so thank you for all your books. You. Um, I grew up in Poland, actually, and my first degree is from Gdańsk University. I'm bilingual, but I teach, teach English here, and I write in English. I'm a fiction writer. Um, when I 
think about being bilingual, I feel like I'm inhabited, uh, inhabiting two different types of personality. When I am in Polish, I'm a different person than when I'm in English. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about being bilingual and writing in Italian now. Do you feel like you are one person who inhabits sort of two different worlds, or you feel yourself splitting apart and sort of feeling that you are depending on the language, a, a, a totally different sort of person? Well, I think anybody who is fortunate enough to have more than one language recognizes that, you know, I mean, some people go so far as to say if you know more than one language, you have more than one soul. Um, and that's a very thoughtful way of thinking about it. Um, but I, I think, you know, language represents, you know, kind of a very specific but vast universe. And, and each language represents that. And I think, you know, even before I learned Italian, I I always grew up with two languages side by side. And I, maybe I didn't know them in exactly the right kind of the same level of proficiency, but um, but they were both incredibly strong influences on who I was. Um, so, you know, I always was, was, you know, divided in that sense. Um, it, so I think that's true. And I, and I, I can say for the Italian project, you know, as I was saying, you know, this idea of a new point of view that comes from a new language. Um, and in addition, the sense of freedom that a learned language might provide you uh, to just kind of, you know, set to the side certain a certain baggage that the long distance you uh, you, you you traverse in in one uh, in another language you know might be in some sense holding you back um, from saying what you really need to say. So um, so for example, I would never have written under, in other words in in English. I would never have written the clothing of books essay in English. You know. Um, so this is why the Italian is valuable to me. It's interesting. Next question. Hi, Jumpa. So um, one thing I found really interesting about the namesake was how you describe Gogol as um, kind of olive-toned and sort of being able to pass as Mediterranean sometimes. Um, and I think that's really interesting, especially given the obvious tension between um, his kind of Indian identity and like assimilating into American culture. And so um, was this a conscious decision to make him able to pass, sort of pass as white? And if so, can you speak to how this relates to your own experiences of colorism and passing? Um, hmm. Well, I, I wasn't really thinking about those things. Um, I think... I think um, I, I, I'm now recalling maybe there's a moment in the book where someone says to him, oh, you could be Spanish or something. Um, but I think that's more about projecting, not about who he is, but maybe how we project, what we, how we like to project kind of sameness onto other people, right, to make them more comfortable to us. Um, and to dilute the sense of difference. Maybe that's what it's really about. Um, you know, uh, just to go back to this book covers piece, um, there's, a, there's a certain part of the essay in which I talk about the intolerance of, of, of foreign, my foreign publishers uh, for, for the various book covers. So, you know, I, I mean, I remember showing my one of my publishers, I'm not going to, Make, specify anybody here, um, but I remember. I, 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 I'll just say this: I was in Rome, and the Italian cover of, of in other words, in altre parole, had, it had come out, and one of my other publishers was visiting, and I showed it to this person, and I just remember the expression on, you know, it was like <laughs> interesting, you know, <laughs> and I think that is really what is that the heart of the matter. It's just that refusal to recognize ourselves in the other. 
right? So if you have someone who has a kind of, you know, features that can can be perceived as this or per, be perceived as that, I mean, you know, I mean, depending on where I go in the world, I, I'm mistaken for lots of things, you know, if I'm in Latin America, if I'm in India, if I'm in you know, maybe some other places and sometimes not. And sometimes I'm immediately identified as, as the other, but I think it's sort of more based on the context and not on the person. Um, but I, I wasn't really thinking very deeply about it, to be honest with you. Um, I think it was just one of those small details about other people's de- desire to, to, to render sa- the same people who are, who are actually different, you know, Next question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One thing that I found I find so powerful about your work is that you not only understand the viewpoint of being a child of immigrants, but also your parents' um, viewpoint as well. And if you feel comfortable sharing, I'm wondering, um, to what extent have you spoken to your parents about the joys and challenge, challenges of the immigrant experience? Or was that something that you more so inferred from your own observations? So you're asking if I asked my parents what it was like to be an immigrant? Mm-hmm. Did you ever have those like deep, meaningful conversations about that experience, or did you feel like it was more so something that you observed? I was living that experience. That was my whole experience. That was my whole life. I mean, there was no moment where I wasn't aware that my parents came from a place that was very far away, where people spoke a different language and ate different food and wore different clothes and thought about the world in different ways and that they were, they were not there, you know, and that's, that's my life. Um, that's, that's my whole life. And there's no part of my life that was any, anything else, you know, I mean, I, and every, every relationship I had, uh, that I made, that I created, that I forged outside of, you know, my, my family kind of base, was was informed by that that awareness you know that this is these were the parents that had brought me into the world and this is what their experience was um so no i never i never sat ever sat down and asked them what it was like because i was living it every single day and i saw the the effects of what it means to live your life away from the your point of reference Right. Um, so, and and this just goes so deep and and so vast and so specific and so minute by minute, um, and that constant back and forth, you know, in one's being to to kind of make sense and to be. I mean, it's like again the interpreter. You know, it's like it's like being a simultaneous interpreter all the time, um, and and I think that. Of course, it's not ironic that my book is called The Interpreter of Maladies and involves <laughs> this character who is literally interpreting simultaneously for, for people because I feel like that's what... But that's not what I was necessarily doing for my parents. It was what I was doing for myself. You know. Next question. Thank you. Um, firstly, my compliments to both of you for such a wonderful conversation. My question is more related to the journey of an author. Um, do you think, compared to when you... Uh, began, uh, began writing, do you feel more inhibited or uninhib- uninhibited as an author now? And what brings that about? Well, writing always scares me and intimidates me. Um, and I've always felt that. And I think if I ever stopped <coughs> feeling that, I, I probably shouldn't write anymore. Um, I think now there's a kind of formal challenge of writing in a, in a language that I don't have full control of. Um, so that's intimidating and, da- you know, just very daunting. Um, but I was talking to a group of students before this larger conversation about how even in English I started out with that same trepidation. Um, and in some sense, I don't want to lose touch with that, you know, that unease, because I think that's important. Um, 
it's important to approach uh, in that in that way, at least for me. Um, you know, not to not feel totally comfortable and certainly not to feel uh, confident because it's really more about an, an investigation, an experiment, um, a challenge, you know. And so these things cannot be undertaken in the spirit of, sure, I can do that, you know. You have to question it at every step and you have to question what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. Um, so I believe that that's very important. Next question. Hi. Um, I just want to start off by thanking you for Gogol's character because there are very few authors that truly understand the Indian American immigrant narrative as well as you do. Um, and my question is, of all the characters you've penned, which one do you see yourself most in, or is there one, and why? Thank you. Well, um, you know, I mean, there, there are pieces of me and some of, of, of various things I've written, um, aspects uh, kind of concealed or jumbled together, rearranged, um, you know, so, so various characters, you know, if I, if I had to say, you know, they, they're, they're shadings, um, that I feel close to literally. Um, but, uh, but I think, um, as I say in the afterward, afterward to, in other words, um, the most, kind of explicitly autobiographical story I've ever written is the first story I wrote in Italian, which is called The Exchange, which is a very weird, abstract story, um, but that came literally from an experience I had, and um, and I, I, made, I wrote the story very quickly afterward based on that experience, and it was just sort of lifted from something that ha had happened to me. So in that sense, I feel very close to that character, needless to say, because I, I shared, you know, what happened. Though there are certain invented details in that story as well, and I'm not, and because it's fiction, you know, it's not the truth. Um, but Agota Kristoff, if you really want to talk about this stuff and think about it, read Agota Kristoff, because she's just, she's, the, she's a genius. She's like the oracle of all of this stuff, you know. She really knows uh, what it means to... to to create out of life and that incredibly fluid, mysterious boundary between real life and art. Um, her, her work investigates it just head on in a way that's um, unforgettably powerful. Last question. We have three minutes total. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a couple of quick nuts and bolts questions about writing and your process. Um, your prose is very much characterized by restraint and economy, and I'm curious what kind of writer you are. Are you a linear writer who gets it, you know, each sentence right before you move on to the next, or are you, do you overwrite and cut back mercilessly? Um, and my other question is that you write often of nostalgia and longing, and I'm curious how you avoid sentimentality. Um... Well, that's nice to hear. <laughs> um, I'm glad that that's the case, uh, in your opinion. Um, you know, I think I write about loss. Um, I write less about nostalgia, I think. Uh, I mean, it's connected, of course. Um, but uh, but it, that's really what the writing, you know, everything I've written has that. Um, at its core, the idea of loss. Um, and, uh, and as for how I write, I just, I mean, I, I don't know how I write, but I certainly am, I'm not, you know, I mean, I, I go through, you know, a, a million drafts and I'm constantly re reworking everything. So, you know, the idea of writing a sentence that's, you know, that's all set to go and then moving on to the next one is, is, it's the opposite. Whatever the opposite of that is, that's, <laughs> that's how I work. Jumpa, thank you very much. Let's have a big round of applause. <laughs>